Welcome to the second part of our discussion regarding reference ranges and conversion factors. But today, we'll be focusing more on urine and other body fluids. Let's deal with our first body fluid. As a medical technology student, we all know that the urine is a liquid byproduct of metabolism in humans and in many other animals. Urine flows from the kidneys through the ureters to the urinary bladder. Urination results in urine being excreted from what urinary organ? The urethra. Just a brief recap, the urine contains water, urea, which is a waste product that forms when proteins are broken down. Remember that? What gives the urine its characteristic yellowish color? That is a pigment from the blood product known as urochrome. From a patient's point of view, the urine is one of the easiest sample to be collected. Let's start with acetoacetic acid. The type of urine sample that is needed is any type or a random urine. The expected normal result is negative. If you can remember in your clinical microscopy, the ADIS count is a urine test measuring urinary casts over time. It is named from Thomas Addis. Expected normal results under conventional units for WBC and epithelial cells is 1,800,000 per 12-hour sample collection. Red blood cells must be around 500,000 for 12 hours and hyaline casts must be less than 5,000 per 12 hours. The conversion factor use is 1. I also want to clarify parts like this, as you can see in albumin, for random samples, you can only test qualitatively the result for albumin, and the expected is negative. While for 24-hour urine samples, it can be done quantitatively and the expected results under conventional units is 15 to 150 milligrams per day. The conversion factor used is 0.001, giving it an SI value of 0.015 to 0.150 grams per day. From this slide, let's take a look at calcium. When you use random urine specimens, you can test them qualitatively using Solkowicz method and detect for the presence of turbidity. If you use 24-hour urine samples, that can be done quantitatively. So when you have an average diet, the expected results under conventional is 100 to 240 milligrams per day. But if you have low calcium diet, then expect that, that there should be less than 150 milligrams per day. And if ever you also have high calcium diet, you have more or less 240 to 300 milligrams per day. Use the conversion factor of 0 0.02495, multiply the conventional values in order to get your SI unit values. Don't miss out too on catecholamines. When you use random urine samples, expect that you will get less than 14 micrograms per deciliter. And when you use a 24-hour urine sample, that's less than 100 micrograms per day. I also want you to take note class the difference between their conversion factors. For random samples, you make use of 59.11, but if you use 24 hours, your conversion factor changes at least one decimal to the left. So that's 5.911. Take note of that, please. For concentration tests, 
Fishberg's method. You make use of a random urine sample as the specimen of choice. You may take specific gravity and also osmolality. In this part here, kindly get your notes and your pen. Kindly fill this out for me. For total estrogen, when you make use of 24-hour urine samples, for the males, expected is 5 to 18 micrograms per day. Make use of 3.468 as the conversion factor. Under females class, ovulation is at 28 to 100 micrograms per day. Luteal peak is 22 to 80 micrograms per day. And when you're at menses, that's 4 to 25 micrograms per day. The conversion factor used for all these three is 3.468, the same that of the male. But when you are pregnant, so under pregnancy, expected um, normal values must be up to 45,000 micrograms per day. And the conversion factor is... 0.003468 That means the result under SI value is up to 156 micromoles per day If you are under postmenopausal that's up to 10 micrograms per day using again the conversion factor of 3.468 For fractionated estrogen we have E1, E2, and E3. E1 is named as estrone or est1, estradiol for E2, and estriol for E3. Take note also that they have different conversion factors. When you have estrone, that's 3.699. For estradiol, that's 3.671. And for estriol, that's 3.468. For glucose, we also have two types of tests can be qualitative done during the chemical examination of your urine. And if ever we do it quantitatively, we make use of a 24-hour urine sample. If we test for copper-reducing substances, the expected conventional unit result is 0 0.5 to 1.5 grams per day. But if we try to check for the total sugars, that's an average of 250 milligrams per day. So both of this makes use of conversion factor 1. While checking for glucose itself is an average of 130 milligrams per day. Don't forget that the conversion factor for glucose is always 0 0.005551. Once again, just a reminder that you really don't need to memorize all of this. But if you can, why not, right? But I only encourage you to familiarize the values. I know you can do it. So let's continue. Do not forget that the best specimen for pregnancy test is your concentrated first morning urine. Under phenol sulfontalane, the urine is timed after 6 mg of PSP administered intravenously. So after 15 minutes, 20 to 50 percent of the dye can be excreted. 30 minutes is 16 to 24 percent dye excreted. 60 minutes is 9 to 17 percent dye excreted. And after 120 minutes, 3 to 10 percent dye excreted. The conversion factor used is 0 0.01. Under urobilinogen, as you can see there, class, that if you use Ehrlich units as the unit of measure, the conversion factor used is 1. But if you use milligrams per day, then the conversion factor is 1.693.
Next is synovial fluid. A synovial fluid analysis is a group of tests that detect changes in the synovial or the joint fluid. Synovial fluid is the liquid that surrounds and lubricates your joints. When patients have swollen, painful joints, a synovial fluid analysis can give valuable information about the underlying source of the problem. Actually, a number of tests can be conducted on synovial fluid after it is extracted from the joint space during a procedure called, what is it again? Arthrocentesis. The appearance of synovial fluid as well as its chemical properties, microscopic composition, and other signs of infectious disease may be analyzed. Here are some of the tests that we can do with synovial fluid. Blood serum, synovial fluid, glucose difference. The normal result will be less than 10 mg per deciliter. The same thing, the conversion factor used is 0 0.05551. In the differential cell count, granulocytes are detected with less than 25% of them are nucleated cells. Conversion factor used is 0 0.01. Fibrin clot in a normal synovial fluid class is absent. So that means it must be a liquid, but there should be no clot. Remember that your synovial fluid has an egg white-like consistency. And the principal role of synovial fluid is to reduce friction between the articular cartilage of synovial joints during movement. Aside from fibrin clots, we will also be taking note of mucin clots in synovial fluid. If you can remember, this test is performed by mixing about one part of the centrifuge synovial fluid. So you extract the supernatant from the centrifuge synovial fluid with four parts of 2.5% glacial acetic acid. The acid causes precipitation or clumping of synovial fluid mucin. After gently mixing, the clump mucin is then observed. So, the result to this, the normal result to this, should be abundant. Nucleated cell count, there should be less than 200 cells per microliter found in the synovial fluid with less than 10% of the nucleated cells in normal synovial fluid are what type of granulocytes? Neutrophils or segmenters. Viscosity of a normal synovial fluid is high and the volume during arthrocentesis is less than 3.5 ml using a conversion factor of 0 0.001 Another body fluid from the males is seminal fluid Seminal fluid or also called semen is a fluid that is emitted from the male reproductive tract and that contains sperm cells which are capable of fertilizing the female's eggs Semen also contains liquids that combine to form seminal plasma, which helps keep the sperm cells viable. The only mode of collection for seminal fluid is through masturbation. Remember that during the process of ejaculation, liquids from the prostate gland and seminal vesicles are added, which help dilute the concentration of sperm and provide a suitable environment for them. Fluids contributed by the seminal vesicles are approximately 60% of the total semen volume. These fluids contain fructose, amino acids, citric acid, phosphorus, potassium, and hormones known as prostaglandins. The prostate gland also contributes about 30% of the seminal fluid. The constituents of its secretions are mainly citric acid, acid phosphatase, calcium, sodium, 
zinc, potassium, protein-splitting enzymes, and fibrolysine. A small amount of fluid is secreted by the bulbourethral and urethral glands. This one is thick, clear, lubricating protein commonly known as the mucus. The expected results of a normal seminal fluid are as follows. Liquefaction time should be within 20 minutes. Sperm morphology must be more than 70%. Normal, mature spermatozoa should be found. Conversion factor use is 0.01. Sperm motility is more than 60%, has a forward and directional movement. pH must be more than 7, an average of 7.7. .7. Alkaline or alkalinity is the normal pH of a seminal fluid. Sperm count must be around 60 to 150 times 10 to the power of 6 per ml. And the volume is around 1.5 to 5 ml. The conversion factor used for sperm count is 10 to the power of 3, while for volume, it's 0 0.001 to get an SI unit value of 0 0.0015 to 0 0.0050 liters. Up next is gastric fluid. Gastric acid or gastric juice or sometimes called as stomach acid is a digestive fluid formed within the stomach lining. With a pH between 1 and 3, gastric acid plays a key role in digestion of proteins by activating digestive enzymes, which together break down the long chains of amino acids of proteins. Gastric acid is regulated in a feedback type of system to increase production when needed, such as after a meal. Other cells in the stomach produce bicarbonate, which is a base to buffer the fluid, ensuring a regulated pH. These cells also produce mucus, a viscous barrier to prevent gastric acid from damaging the stomach. The pancreas further produces large amounts of bicarbonate and secretes bicarbonate through the pancreatic duct to the duodenum to neutralize gastric acid passing into the digestive tract. The active components of gastric acid are protons and chloride, often simplistically described as hydrochloric acid. These species are produced by parietal cells in the gastric glands of the stomach. The secretion is a complex and relatively energetically expensive process. Parietal cells contain an extensive secretory network called the canaliculi from which the hydrochloric acid is secreted into the lumen of the stomach. The pH of gastric acid is around 1.5 to 3.5 in the human stomach lumen. The parietal cell releases bicarbonate into the bloodstream in the process, which causes a temporary rise of pH in the blood, known as an alkaline tide. The highly acidic environment in the stomach lumen degrades proteins. Peptide bonds, which comprise proteins, are labelized, and the gastric chief cells of the stomach secretes enzymes for protein breakdown. The low pH activates pepsinogen into the enzyme pepsin, which then aids digestion by breaking the amino acid bonds, a process called proteolysis. In addition, many microorganisms are inhibited or destroyed in an acidic environment, preventing infection or sickness. A typical human adult stomach will secrete about 1.5 liters of gastric acid daily. 
If you can remember, there are actually three phases in the secretion of gastric acid, which increase the secretion rate in order to digest a meal. Number one is the cephalic phase, which comprises 30% of the total gastric acid secretions to be produced through a stimuli by the anticipation of eating and the smell or taste of food. This signaling occurs from higher centers in the brain through the vagus nerve and then activating the parietal cells to release the acid. Next is the gastric phase, which comprises about 60% of the total acid for a meal is secreted in this phase. Acid secretion is stimulated by the distension of the stomach and by amino acids present in the food. And lastly, the intestinal phase, which comprises the remaining 10% of acid that is secreted when chyme enters the small intestine and is stimulated by small intestine distension and by amino acids. Here are the normal results for gastric fluid. A fasting residual volume should be around 20 to 100 ml making use of 0.001 as a conversion factor, giving it an SI unit value of 0.02 to 0.10 liters. The normal pH of gastric fluid is less than 2. Basal acid output is 0 to 6 milliequivalents per hour using the conversion factor of 1 giving it an SI unit value of 0 to 6 millimoles per hour. There's also maximum acid output. This is done after histamine stimulation. That's around 5 to 40 milliequivalents per hour. The same thing using a conversion factor of 1, turning it into 5 to 40 millimoles per hour. And the normal gastric fluid Baumau ratio or the basal acid output over maximum acid output is less than 0 0.4. Next is amniotic fluid. Amniotic fluid is a clear yellow fluid which is found within the first 12 days following conception within the amniotic sac. It surrounds the growing baby inside the uterus. Let's learn about fast facts on amniotic fluid. At first, amniotic fluid consists of water from the mother's body, but gradually the larger proportion is now made up of the baby's urine. It also contains important nutrients, hormones, and antibodies, and it helps protect the baby from bumps and injury. If the levels of amniotic fluid levels are too low or too high, this can now pose a problem. There are actually two conditions that can cause a pregnant mother to undergo amniocentesis. That is, if there is oligohydramnios or polyhydramnios. There are a lot of functions this amniotic fluid is responsible for. Of course, protecting the fetus, controlling the temperature, and also infection gives development to lung and digestive system, including also muscle and bone development. This can provide lubrication and umbilical cord support. Amniocentesis is often carried out between 15 and 18 weeks of gestation. In the test, an ultrasound guides a 22-gauge spinal needle to a safe place in the amniotic sac. The needle extracts between 10 and 20 milliliters of amniotic fluid from the sac and the fluid is sent for testing. This represents about 1 ml of fluid per week of gestation. These are some of the reasons for doing the amniocentesis procedure in second trimester. If the mother's age during conception is about 35 and older, 
there is a history of a previous child that has a birth defect or when during a blood test or doing the ultrasound procedure it suggests a birth defect there's also a family history of a birth defect or a genetic disorder here are also some of the reasons for doing the amniocentesis procedure on the third trimester this is to determine fetal lung maturity to diagnose a occurring uterine infection and to check if the baby is having an anemia due to RH incompatibility. Again, amniocentesis is a prenatal testing procedure not done commonly. This is just performed for those who really need to have a testing. This is performed during the second or third trimester of pregnancy. During amniocentesis, the healthcare provider uses a thin needle to remove a small amount of amniotic fluid from the sac surrounding the unborn baby. This is done so carefully using a sonogram and they make sure that they don't puncture the placenta. Is this procedure risky? Actually, most amniocentesis procedures are performed safely. But amniocentesis does present small but serious risk for both of you and your baby. In less than 1% of the cases, amniocentesis leads to miscarriage or early delivery. Other risks include an injury or infection that could affect the health of you and your baby. However, these complications rarely happen. That is the reason why after amniocentesis procedure, usually they still try to use ultrasound to monitor fetal heartbeats. If the mother experiences mild cramping or distension or pressure in the lower abdomen, and then after the amniocentesis test, your healthcare provider will inform you to go home and relax for the rest of the day, avoiding any activity that takes a lot of physical effort such as exercise or even sex. You should also feel ready to get back to your regular routine one to two days after the amniocentesis procedure. Here are the normal results for amniotic fluid analysis. As you can see from the table that I have provided below, there are always two normal results per component or tests done. There is one for early gestation and the other one is for term. Kindly recheck for me if the table that I have provided here in the PowerPoint and in your notes coincide. Don't be confused, class, if you see, like, for example, in urea, there's early gestation, 18 plus minus 5.9 milligrams per deciliter. So, meaning the normal range for urea in amniotic fluid is 18, either add 5.9 or subtract 5.9 from 18. Is that understood? Next is cerebrospinal fluid. Cerebrospinal fluid or the CSF is a clear fluid that surrounds the brain and spinal cord. It cushions the brain and spinal cord from injury and also serves as a nutrient delivery and waste removal system for the brain. CSF is manufactured continuously in areas of the brain called ventricles and is absorbed by the bloodstream. If a doctor thinks you have an illness 
that affects your nervous system, they might take a sample for testing. The fluid is made by a group of cells called the choroid plexus that are deep inside your brain. Your body has about 150 milliliters of fluid that's roughly two-thirds of a cup. As the colorless fluid goes around your brain and spinal cord, it cautions those organs, picks up needed supplies for your blood, and gets rid of waste products from brain cells. Sometimes, cerebrospinal fluid can have things in it that shouldn't be there, like bacteria or viruses that can attack your brain. With some illnesses, what's in that fluid can help your doctor figure out what's going on. The following medications on the screen are asked to be stopped prior to lumbar tap or spinal tap procedures. Blood tests can also be done and you will also be asked if you have any allergies when it comes to local anesthesia. In the next video, it will show how is a lumbar puncture done. The procedure in order to collect cerebrospinal fluid is called a spinal tap or lumbar puncture. They'll take a small sample of cerebrospinal fluid using a long, thin needle. You are asked to orient yourself in any of these two positions shown on the video. You will get a local anesthetics to numb the skin in the area where they will collect the CSF and the needle will go in between two of your vertebrae. So these are the bones that surround your spinal cord and make up your spine. They'll take a tablespoon or two of the fluid for testing. It usually takes about 30 to 45 minutes and you'll be asked to rest for a while afterward and may be told not to do anything strenuous for the entire day. In this table, it shows here the different tests done on your cerebrospinal fluid. For albumin, never forget that the conversion factor for that is 10, and the normal value in CSF is less than 10 to 30 milligrams per deciliter. Cell count in CSF must be less than 5 cells per microliter. Glucose content in the CSF is 40 to 80 milligrams per deciliter. And lactate dehydrogenase activity is approximately 10% of that in the serum level. Proteins must be around 12 to 60 milligrams per deciliter. And kindly check the protein electrophoresis pattern and results for me. Checking for santochromia must be negative. When you say santochromia class, this is the presence of bilirubin or a yellowish or any color, by the way, it's that's any color that is present in the cerebrospinal fluid and is sometimes the only sign of an acute subarachnoid hemorrhage. Again, santochromia is the presence of bilirubin in CSF associated with high spinal fluid protein content usually found above levels of 150 milligrams per deciliter. Under miscellaneous, this means that we will be talking about various types of samples that come from different sources. In this table, kindly take a look at the different tests done and the different samples or specimens used. Again, don't be confused if you can see plus minus signs all over. As you can see from clearance, it means that endogenous creatinine normal results will be 115 plus minus 20 milliliters per minute. That means 115 plus 20 is still considered to be normal or 115 minus 20 is still considered normal. So once again, please don't 
fail to familiarize all of these because this will help you in the board examination. Kindly include studying all these additional information that I have provided for you. We are done with the part two of our discussion regarding reference ranges and conversion factors. Stay tuned for part three about hematologic normal values as well as the selected pediatric reference ranges. Thank you so much for listening and God bless us all.